that sun in the morning, peeking over the hill. I'll bet you're sure it always has, and sure it always will. That's how I feel about someone, how somebody feels about me. We're sure we love each other, that's the way we'll always, always be. Oh, we ain't got a barrel of money, maybe, maybe we're ragged and funny, but we'll travel along singing a song side by side. Don't know what's coming tomorrow Maybe, Maybe it's trouble and sorrow But we'll travel the road Sharing our load Side by side Through all kinds of weather What if the sky should fall Just as long as we're together It doesn't matter at all When they quarrels and parted we'll, we'll be the same as we started just traveling along singing a song side by side oh we ain't got a barrel of money maybe a ragged and funny but we'll travel along singing a song side by side don't know what's coming tomorrow maybe maybe it's trouble and sorrow but we'll travel the road sharing our load side by side through all kinds of weather what if the sky should fall just as long as we're together it doesn't matter and parted. We'll be, we'll be the same as we started, just traveling along, singing a song, side by side. Come, come, whoever you are, you are welcome here. No matter your age, your size, the color of your eyes, your hair, your skin, you are welcome here. No matter your gender, whom you love, how you speak, or whatever your abilities, you are welcome here. Whether you come with laughter in your heart or tears in your eyes, you are welcome here. Whether you believe in God all of the time or some of the time, or none of the time. You are welcome here. This is a community of open minds, loving hearts, and willing hands. As we gather, we acknowledge that the ground upon which we gather is the ancestral and current home of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. With humility, we begin to partner, to ally and witness with our indigenous siblings and friends, the bringing forth of a world healed to a greater wholeness. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Uh, my name's Tom, my pronouns are he and him, and we want to uh, welcome everybody who's here in the sanctuary, also our online audience, those that are watching from home. We are especially uh, grateful for those of you who are here for the first or second or third time. Um, we're glad you're here with us. We look forward to getting to know you. There's a lot of friendly and wonderful people here. Um, we have just a couple of announcements as we get started, or a few, I should say. Uh, on Friday, uh, there will be a film screening of The 13th, the movie called The 13th, with a discussion following with the Anti-Racism Task Force, 7 p.m. in the sanctuary on Friday, February 16th. Uh, next Sunday, Sunday the 18th, uh, Reverend Bob Lavelle will be here with us uh, to co-preach with Reverend Laura. Uh, Reverend Bob was our interim minister from the fall of 2018 to the summer of 2019, and he's been itching to return and see how the congregation is doing and share the pulpit with Reverend Laura. So come next week and you get to say hi to an old friend. 
Uh, the big event is happening in two weeks, two weeks from yesterday, uh, February 24th, uh, 7 p.m. right here in this space. So we hope you will all join us for a little Saturday evening party. Um, and Jordan, do you have, or no? Oh, Kevin, sorry. Kevin's gonna have one other announcement. It's finally happening, the men's group. Um, all men, or those that identify as male, are welcome to come. It is about building friendship. It's about building mental health. Men are struggling in today's society. So, I would, uh, we're having uh, our first meeting to kind of identify what we want from this group. It is not my group, it is our group. And so I want as many people's input for this as possible. And I'm sorry, I don't know, it's after church. Is there a room? The Seekers Room. Um, we'll give you a few minutes uh, after, grab a cup of coffee and that, and then let's get together and decide where we want to go with this. Um, I will say the covenant is basically our principles. So I think we can all agree upon that. It's the direction of where we go and how we build a united community. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. There's so many wonderful groups that meet uh, after on a regular basis. Anyway, so it's exciting. We're starting up a new one, the men's group after church uh, downstairs. So at this point, I encourage you to uh, get to know someone around you that you may not have uh, introduced yourself to yet. Let's all stand and share the warmth of community for just a moment. You can remain standing if you wish also for our chalice lighting. Let us light our chalice this morning. The words are in your order of service as we wait for the matching Johansson duo to come up. Max and his dad Josh, we're going to light our chalice this morning. We light this chalice for the warmth of love, for the light of truth, and for the energy of action. And you may be seated. It is good to be together this morning. I am the Reverend Laura Young. My pronouns are she, her, and hers. And it's nice to see that people have adjusted to the new start time. More and more you're here by at least 10.15. It's good. <laughs> um, as we sort of, I just want to invite you to sort of settle into this time of worship. We have a lot going on uh, today in worship and after worship. Uh, so I will just keep my call to worship very short, which is, I'm glad you're here. It's good to be together, especially when all the times and places where we can't be together are in our hearts. It's good to be reunited and to just be and breathe with one another. So I'm going to invite the children now to come forward for a time for all ages. So this story today is called Could Be Worse. Could Be Worse by James Stevenson. If you were a child of the 1970s like I am, you might have come across this book. And I have to tell you, it was one of my favorite books as a child. When I went back and read it as an adult a few years ago, I, I had a little different reaction to it, but I still think it's great in its own way. And so here's my question for you. Have you ever been through something hard? A hard day at school or just something that made you really sad? Yeah, we probably all have. You can raise your hand in the audience, too. Yeah, so what do we call that when we're going through a hard time? Bad day? 
a bad time in our life, something hard that makes us sad. Another word for that is sometimes called suffering, sort of suffering. It's like when we don't feel good, like maybe we were sick or maybe we're in a fight with a friend or our sister or brother. Um, and sometimes it can be, but sometimes there are things that happen that are really bad, right? Like big, bad things. And we can struggle to figure out how to, how to get through them, right? So this is one person's, this story is one person's version of how we might get through hard things. And I will give big points to the person who can identify the philosophy that this is based on. Could be worse. At grandpa's house, all things were always the same. Grandpa always had the same thing for breakfast. Every day, he read the newspaper. And he always said the same thing. Could be worse. Grandpa, that awful dog ate this sofa cushion. Could be worse. No matter what. I got a splinter in my finger, Grandpa. Could be worse. My bike has a flat and my sneakers have a hole and I lost my kite in a tree, Grandpa. Could be worse. One day, Marianne said, how come Grandpa never says anything else? I guess that's because nothing ever happens to him, said Louie. The next morning at breakfast, Grandpa said something different. He said, guess what? And the children here have little exclamation points above their heads like, Last night, when I was asleep, a large bird pulled me out of bed and took me for a long ride and dropped me in the mountains. I heard a noise, rumble, rumble, grumble, and it was an abominable snowman with a huge snowball, which he threw at me. I got stuck inside the snowball, which rolled down the mountain. It finally landed on the desert and began to melt. It must have been in Utah. <laughs> yeah, because of that rock and also high mountains and a desert at the same place. It might have hurt. I think, it, you know, I don't know if I'd like rolling down a hill in a snowball. I walked across the desert Suddenly, I heard footsteps coming nearer and nearer. A moment later, I got squashed by a giant something or other. There's a, bit, there's a picture of a very odd monster. What is it even? I don't know. What do you think? Some sort of... A dog? An alligator dog? A black dog? Maybe. Maybe. Before I could get up, I heard a strange noise. A great bob of marmalade was coming towards me, and it chased me across the desert until I crashed into something tall. It was sort of like an ostrich and very cross. It gave me a big kick. Not a very nice ostrichy type bird, is it? It gave me a big kick. I went up into some storm clouds, almost got hit by lightning, fell out of the clouds, and landed in an ocean. I sank down about a mile to the bottom. I think it's, he says it's an, an enormous goldfish, but I think turtle would work too. I saw an enormous goldfish swimming towards me. I swam away as fast as I could and hid under a cup that had air in it. When I was safe, I started to walk, 
But my foot got stuck. In a giant lobster claw. It's not a great day so far, is it? I don't know what to do, but then a squid came along and squirted black ink all over the lobster. I escaped and hitched a ride on a sea turtle. There's your turtle. That was going to the top for a bit of sunshine. I was fortunate to find a piece of toast floating by, and I rode to shore where I discovered a newspaper, I quickly folded it into an airplane and flew across the sea and back home to bed. Now, what do you think of that? Could be worse. His grandchildren say to him. So, that's one way of dealing with hard things, right? Is it the only way? No. Are there some other ways that we can deal with hard things? Like maybe asking for help, talking to a friend. Okay, who's figured out what this philosophy is called? Stoicism. Stoicism. It's the idea that no matter what happens, it's all the same. And it's a very helpful philosophy, but it does have its limitations. It could be really boring, right? Because you're trying not to have a reaction ever. Trying not to have a reaction. Well, thanks for participating in this. I'm going to have you all stay here for a moment because... We have something new for the whole congregation this morning. We have a new sending song. And our choir is going to teach it to all of us. This time I'd like to invite Tucker Gurney to come forward. She's a longtime member of our congregation to share with us a little bit about why she's part of our community. Hi, my name's Tucker Gurney, and I've been coming to South Valley since January 1st of the year 2000. And I could tell you the story of why I came and what happened initially, but today I want to focus on why I keep coming. What is it that draws me here and keeps me coming here? So I want to preface that by saying I'm not a comfortable public speaker. I don't like big parties. I don't like big events. But we've got a big event coming up, and I've been to quite a few big events and always with some hesitation, because that's not my style. But this is a place where there are wonderful people doing wonderful things, and there's a space for people comfortable with big events and places here for people who prefer small events, like me. So I hope that you will find your 
space that you're comfortable with here and continue to come. I think the thing that has made the most sense for me is to get involved, to do things, to be a part of the actions to into the community or to work on projects here in the congregation, in the church. I know that that has made a difference for my husband also. And he's now part of the humanist group. And I think that has given him a stronger connection to the church. So find your niche, find your way of being comfortable here and continue to come because it's a, a very strong community. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tucker. There's so many great ways to engage with this community in different ways. I like, I like how Tucker highlighted that we all engage in different ways. Um, our church and its many ministries are only made possible through the gifts that you give of your time, your talent, and your treasure. Many of you pledge monthly um, online, and we appreciate that. Uh, your gifts help to ensure that we're able to live our lives uh, or live our values of love and justice in the world. Part of our ministry at South Valley includes sharing our Sunday worship offerings with a charitable organization. We always split the plates, so to speak, with, uh, with a charitable organization that aligns with our principles and values. So for the months of January and February, we're supporting the Boa Ogoy Land Restoration Project at the site of the Bear River Massacre in southern Idaho. Um, oh, I, I didn't even, are we doing that now? Okay, sorry. <laughs> I should have read through this before I got up here, sorry. Um, anyway, but this morning we're actually very pleased to have Brad Perry, who is the Vice Chairman of, and uh, Natural Resources Officer of the Northwestern Band of the Shoshone Nation to share with us more about the project, its goals, and how you can participate. Brad? Thank you. Uh, good morning, my friends. Uh, thank you for letting me attend and for um, thinking of the Northwestern Band of Shoshone Nation and its restoration at what we call the Bear River Massacre site. Um, I'd like to talk to you just a, a little bit about what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, the Bear River Massacre in history happened on January 29th of 1863. A group of soldiers from Fort Douglas uh, marched the 100 miles or so up to what is now uh, Preston, Idaho, and just commenced on um, massacring the tribe. Uh, we lost about 500 members there that day, um, unprovoked, um, uh, unwarranted, and, uh, and really was the saddest thing that has ever happened to our people. <laughs> So for the last 160 years, we've always um, come to that place and tried to memorialize our people there. Um, in 2018, we purchased the property back and purchased that site. And it, over the last 160 years, it's been used as uh, an agri agricultural site, you know, whether for growing grain or, or um, a grazing land for cattle, but they did a lot of different things to the land, you know, to irrigate. You have to move uh, creeks and, and rivers into channelized systems. Uh, you have to cut down all the trees so you can have more places to grow, and you, you do away with all the berries and, and wild rose and things that, that would grow there. Part of our project, now that we own it, when we, when we looked back at it, um, the first thing someone had said was like, well, let's build a, a museum and interpretive center nearby so we can tell people. And we said, yeah, that would be great. We need to, we need to look into that. Our tribal elders were pretty quickly, uh, pretty quickly stopped us and said, in order for us to tell our story and honor those people, we need to restore the land because that's what we belong to. We don't really own it. We belong to it. That was a wintering place for us for thousands and thousands of years. 
recently, working with the University of Utah Anthropology Department, we found an arrowhead that dated back to about three or 4,000 years ago. The University of Utah is still studying that. And uh, we know that we have always had a place there. There were sacred hot springs there that we would use for healing. And also, all the Shoshone tribes in the area were welcome to come and gather there for what was called the warm dance, to try and bring on spring and, and, and get together. It was a spiritual revival, basically. Um, and, you know, probably one of the greatest powwows that had gone on, you know, amongst the Shoshone people, because you caught up on gossip, you played games, uh, you gambled a little, because uh, Indians love those sorts of things. Uh, sometimes you met your spouse, you got to catch up with other family members. And so this is the area I'm talking about. And so in one day, the bloodiest massacre in the United States history changed the spirit of that site. We're looking to, to grab that back and flip it. So at the site, we have begun an ecological restoration. We're, we, by, we have started removing uh, non-invasive species. You know, things that w wouldn't have been there when our ancestors were there, like Russian olive and crack willow and other invasive trees and species that have come in and that aren't good for uh, the climate or good for the water or good for the area and the ground. And when you do that, to, to help them keep from growing back, you, you plant back native vegetation, vegetation. This last November, I know there were probably uh, a few of you or several of you that, that attended our first volunteer planting day. We put in 8,500 plants and trees in one, in one day within four hours. And it was phenomenal. It was a phenomenal event to have the community there and to feel the, to feel the, the spiritual connection that we had with the community and with our people. Um, and so we're going to continue to do those things. We're going to take that irrigation ditch out of, it, out of its channel and run it back into the original river meanders. Um, uh, our intention is to bring back fish, which will bring back, which will bring back the eagle and trumpeter swans and different things that are important to us. We'll plant several cottonwood trees, many more willows and, and cattails and milkweed to help bring back the monarch butterfly. And these things are all medicinal and these things were used um, by our people long ago. Uh, in our journey, um, we have found that partnering with the community is a, is, a, is, is a better way to do that. And so we appreciate when people come up to us. Um, we figure that we'll have water running in the old uh, creek channels as early as 2026. Our goal is to plant another 250,000 more plants and trees. So we will have plenty of volunteer opportunities. We want to honor our people by returning the land to its original state, into an ecological state that will, that will continue to live off of itself and benefit the Great Salt Lake. We know if the things that we're just right now planning to do, we'll send 13,000 acre feet of water per year to the Great Salt Lake that has not recently, that has not been making it there. Um, and so our efforts are communal, our efforts are tribal, our efforts are to, to recognize these people. When finished, we hope that we have a place that the community can come and will feel the spirit of the warm dance rather than the spirit of a massacre. We want, we want uh, reverence and healing and reminiscence to, to abound there. And, you know, what a wonderful thing to plant choke cherry trees and wild rose and spearmint and peppermint and some of those things that were already growing there. Um, what, a way, what a way to show the community how we still live and that we're still here and that we can work together as a community. You know, the massacre may have happened because there were several communities that didn't understand each other. And that's changing. You know, we had over 400 volunteers that came that day, and they were from all walks of life and from all organizations. We're starting to understand each other, and we hope that this will continue to be a place that will give back culturally, ecologically, and spiritually to everybody that comes there. And so we're grateful for all of you for, uh, for participating. Um, you know, we are in the community. This is the Northwestern Band of Shoshone Nations, indigenous territory. Our territory goes from the point of the mountain all the way up to the, up to the Snake River in Idaho, Jackson Hole, and over into Nevada a little bit. So we had a large territory for our little band. 
And uh, anything that we can do to help you in your service, we're, please call on us. We would be glad to be uh, partake in those things. But thank you all for letting me come and explain a little bit about the project today and why we're doing it. And thank you for your help and support and prayers for all of those things. Thank you. Thank you so much, Brad. And uh, the song that we're about to sing for you, I think actually ties in really well, even though we didn't really plan it that way. <laughs> but this song is gonna be called uh, Oh Home Beloved, about how our souls are really tied to the land and the place that we call home. But please join with me in reading our offertory words that I believe are in your order of service and maybe even up here. Yeah, they're there, here we go. We are this church. We are its hand, its heart, its voice. Together we share the wealth of this community and sustain it with our gifts. We'll now accept the offering. Uh, for those at home, you're invited to use the giving link on, in the online order of service. And if the ushers could come forward and also my dad and brothers. Thank you for your generosity this morning. May these gifts be a blessing on South Valley and the Bear River Massacre Restoration Project. Thank you again, Brad, for being with us this morning. I invite you now to join me in a time of meditation. And it will lead us into this meditation with a quote from Thich Nhat Hanh, who wrote, People usually consider walking on water 
or in thin air a miracle. But I think the real miracle is not to walk either on water or in thin air, but to walk on the earth. Every day we are engaged in a miracle which we don't even recognize. Blue sky, white clouds, green leaves, and the black, curious eyes of a child. Our own two eyes. All is a miracle. So let us sit with that as a community, in quiet, in reverence, and in peace. Amen. Does everything happen for a reason? Nope. No, it does not. And that's what I want to talk about this morning that not everything happens for a reason. And this is not a repudiation of the laws of physics. Physics still applies. But it is an exposition of the ways in which we can imagine, especially when things go wrong, that we are somehow to blame. It's the problem that theologians and philosophers have long referred to as the problem of evil. And it is a complex problem. And there is no way in the next 20 minutes that I can sum it up for you. Even if I spent the next year exclusively addressing the problem of evil, I think I would only be scratching the surface. Evil has been with us forever, and it looks like it will remain for the foreseeable future. And many philosophers and theologians have addressed this topic in an effort to explain why bad things happen to good people. Rabbi Harold Kushner, who wrote the book, Why Bad Things Happen to Good People, has observed, I think, very carefully that truly this question of evil, this question about why we suffer often horribly and often or mostly even without a knowable cause, is really the only theological question there is. All the others, he writes, are intellectually interesting, but don't really matter. In comparison. This gave me some comfort because it allowed me to realize that in fact we are as a community always asking and answering this question, even when we are not naming it specifically. There is a valuable skill in being able to name precisely and with gravitas 
what exactly evil might be, and to know what we mean when we use such a powerful, complex word. However, most of us would rather not talk about the problem of evil. For one, the word itself is rather charged. I think we can agree. Some of you may have already turned off your mind when I've mentioned that word the very first time. I I hope that you will be able to turn it back on. The word itself is rather charged by centuries of misuse. Second, defining exactly what we mean by evil is pretty challenging. Is it a noun? Is it a verb? An adjective? An adverb? It turns out that all of these apply. And also, evil is so very varied. It almost never shows up the same way. It is forever adapting and adopting new ways of wreaking havoc. Wreaking havoc. It is forever adopting, adapting, and manipulating the very language we use to describe it. When bad things like wildfires and floods, tornadoes and the such happen now, we are mostly able at this point to understand that they are not directed in any way. The fact that one person's house is burned and the next one over is unscathed is no longer seen as a reflection of personal piety or lack thereof. We tend these days not to think God in the form of a tornado is punishing us. This is a good thing. Another day, perhaps we can explore the way in which climate degradation has been turned into a massive sin burden for the individual and the impact that is having on our efforts to mitigate and address the climate crisis we are in. When bad things like war and genocide and political upheaval occur, it gets a little trickier. We have developed ways of understanding this through geopolitical, psychological, and historical lenses. But these are descriptive practices, not definitive ones. They seek to open up the conversation, to provide context and nuance so that we can perhaps be better at avoiding avoiding more mistakes and perhaps point the path towards restoration and renewal. But they don't answer why these things happen in the first place. Why power, for example, collects around autocratic authoritarian leaders so easily and with such horrible impacts. Why justice is often so long coming and uneven if and when it finally arrives. We seek a definitive answer. We want to know the answer because I think we hope deeply that if finally we can settle on an answer, the question will be resolved for all time and the harm will cease. Yet we know, I think, in this community that asking and answering life's deepest questions is rarely definitive and that the real work of our spiritual lives is to try and love the questions themselves. Evil is hard to understand, for it points to the aspects of the universe and our lives that are chaotic, random, uncertain, unfair, and sometimes connected to direct actions, but mostly not. And always surprisingly and shockingly hard to deal with. To talk about evil is to talk about everything we do not control, which is mostly everything. How we answer the question of what evil is matters. It shapes how we can respond to the world. When our responses are rigid or dogmatic, 
shallow or even carelessly thrown out. We can deepen the pain and suffering of the person on the receiving end of an evil, including ourselves. And that matters. There are many, many destructive and harmful theologies of evil and suffering running around in our culture these days. Some of them are quite ancient, and others are recycled versions of these ancient ones. And they hurt. Most of us have been exposed to them, and we have also sometimes probably unwittingly passed them on to others. My goal today is not to persuade you that there is some sort of definitive answer or that there is even a shared definition or a shared approach to how to understand evil. My hope and my goal today is to illuminate some of the pitfalls that are common in our culture when it comes to dealing with, resisting, resolving, and surviving the bad things. Let me start with one of the more popular ideas in our culture. It's been around for a while. It's this idea that maybe evil doesn't actually exist. That maybe it's just a problem of perception. That if we just focus hard enough, then evil will be revealed as neutral or even good. I find this to be a perniciously harmful approach because it is called spiritual bypassing. It has not yet once brought comfort to a grieving heart to tell someone that what they are experiencing is not real. It is also a perversion of the Buddha's teaching that life is suffering. The Buddha meant for us to walk the path of suffering with each other, with compassion, and with presence, not to deny it or otherwise opt out. Another version of this bypassing may be heard in phrases such as, only the good die young, or they are in a better place now in response to a tragic or unexpected death. And again, I guarantee you personally and professionally that these phrases have rarely, if ever, brought comfort to anyone who is deeply grieving, even the most devout. Who it did bring comfort to was the person who offered it. For in offering it, the person has solved the problem of suffering for themselves and can safely exit the conversation. My mom would much rather have lived a full and rich life and been here to listen to me today to speak. She didn't die so that I could somehow refine my soul for your benefit and illumination. She didn't want to die. That's the truth. That was abundantly clear to me 33 years ago, and it remains abundantly clear today. That I survived the experience of her passing away from cancer when I was 17 and found resilience in the aftermath demonstrates nothing of her life's purpose or the quality of her loving heart. But I will tell you this, that the resilience I gained was hard fought because for much of that first decade following her passing, I clung to the idea that somehow it was for the greater good because I didn't know how else to deal with that loss. Thank goodness for a close group of friends, my faith community, that I found in the Unitarian Universalist Society in Santa Barbara and a series of good therapists that helped me to shed that container for suffering. It helped then, and it laid the groundwork for a much more nuanced approach going forward. In the spring of 2009, 
I was told that I had nodules on my thyroid gland and needed a biopsy to determine the next steps. And that biopsy was difficult. The physician had quite a bit of trouble getting a good sample, and so I was poked more than a dozen times, and it hurt. When I was finally done, he told me that if it was benign, I would receive a call from the nurse, and if not, he would personally call me. And a few days later, the doctor called. He was concerned about the shape and the size of the nodules. They were not necessarily cancerous, but they were unusual. And I needed surgery within the month, if possible. And this nurse was going to quickly call me and set up the consultation with the surgeon. I said, okay. And placed the phone on the cool tile counter. And my vision got dark and my breathing got shallow and a howl, an actual howl of fear and anguish burst from up within my body. How could this be happening to me? My children were but six and three at the time. Now, thyroid cancer is highly treatable and rarely fatal. But as a young mom on that day, all I could hear in myself was the gr earlier grief echoing and protesting a repeat offense. In the end, I was and am completely fine. I want you to know that. The nodules turned out to be benign in the end, and so I just chose to wait and watch. And in 2019, my endocrinologist told me that his earlier advice to aggressively treat these nodules with surgery was incorrect. That later research had revealed just how commonplace such nodules can be and that non-intervention is now the best practice. And in 2021, I was told no longer needed to track them unless there was some change. But before I got that news, there was two months in between that afternoon at my kitchen counter and a resolution of sorts. And in between those two months, I routinely noticed that other people seemed to be very eager to define my experience for me. They offered unsolicited opinions about why this was happening to me. Everything from not drinking enough vegetable juice to some deep-seated spiritual issue logged in my throat chakra. And endlessly unhelpful suggestions for what I should do now. Like drinking only vegetable juice, consuming iodine tablets and mountains of kale, or just submitting to the doctor and cutting my thyroid out already, for God's sake. I will note that people with thyroid nodules are actually advised to minimize iodine-rich foods, like kale, in their diets, which I tell you came quite in handy a few years later during the kale revolution. No offense to the kale lovers in the room, but I do draw the line at chocolate-covered kale. I did see that at Whole Foods in the early aughts. Their comments to me did not feel supportive, even though they meant well. These comments instead made me feel isolated, alone in my uncertainty, and they served to increase my suffering rather than reduce it. What got me through that experience and others? What got me through being pushed mercilessly between competing perspectives and well-intentioned but misplaced advice was a seemingly insignificant decision that I made that very first afternoon at my kitchen counter. The decision was to try my best to embrace the uncertainty to somehow find a way to face my fear with courage as best I can, rather than run away or deny it. 
And that decision made all the difference. I followed it then, and I continue to follow it now. And so perhaps that's what I can offer you this morning. That perhaps the answer is not how do we solve the problem of evil for all time or which is the best approach, but that instead, the way through the tough things is to practice presence. That the answer lies not in explaining, extrapolating, or defending your version of how the world might work, but rather in the simple but very challenging practice of drawing closer to suffering and the ones most impacted by suffering. Drawing close, quieting your mind, and shutting your mouth in the kindest way possible. To really be present, to befriend, to listen, to companion, rather than deny, distract, or obscure what is happening. So that is where I hope to ground our deepening conversation about suffering and this idea of evil in the world. That whatever tradition, philosophy, perspective you adopt in order to understand why bad things are happening in the world, to make sure that whatever approach you adopt includes the practice of drawing close. Especially when the one who is suffering is your own sweet self. Because these ideas and philosophies and ways of approaching evil are deeply embedded in us. We often don't choose them. In fact, I would say we don't choose them at all. And if we're not careful as we go through our life to consciously address and name the philosophies that are underneath the surface of our lives, when we are in a time of crisis, that is when they will surface. So it's good to think about it now and in advance if today you are not in crisis. And if you are in crisis today, then I hope that you will find among and within this community a quiet space and a helping hand. When we draw close to suffering in all of its forms, the demands on us can be huge. And so we are also called to be attentive to the resources that we have when we are in a relationship of providing care and support to another. Drawing near, getting quiet, and just being with another who is going through a hard time can be exhausting. So we must also have the good sense to know when to take a break. Otherwise, we may be prone to compassion fatigue, cynicism, despair, and burnout. And I do think it's interesting that in our culture, with all of the ways in which we are ever more connected via social media and global news, that the number one mental health problem is isolation, loneliness, depression, and anxiety. It may be that collectively we all can use a little bit of rest and renewal. We all can use a little bit more practice on how to be present with ourselves and one another. For so long, these ideas of evil have mostly, fought, mostly sought to explain and defend and to manage the bad things and the people impacted by them and to protect those who are not suffering from having to deal with those who have suffered. 
And to be honest, I'm a little tired of being managed. What about you? What I would prefer, and I think you might also, is to be treated as the adult that you actually are. A creative, resilient, fully capable adult or child who is dealing with something super hard and doing their best to get through it and who really just wants to be befriended and encouraged as they move through it in an undefended way. I would like us to be that kind of community, the kind of community where befriending one another happens predictably and on purpose, a community in which we enjoy and celebrate, cry and lament, protest, renew, heal, and companion each other all the time, regularly, predictably, and on purpose. For these are the qualities that we need most in the world right now, and we need them from each other. I think we are already this as a community. And yet, because, of course, this work is never really complete, we get the chance to keep practicing, to keep deepening, to keep learning and growing and responding in ever more thoughtful and compassionate ways. Not in order to be good. Not in order to be good. Because good is not, in fact, the antidote to evil. If it was, you'd never skip church again. You know what is the antidote? Open minds, compassionate hearts, and helping hands. Open minds, compassionate hearts, and helping hands is the antidote. And it is the practice for how we address, respond, and find our way through the bad things that happen to us, around us, and across the whole of the world. Because it is in this space that we can touch our creativity and the heart of our humanity and find that renewal, that restoration, and that deep and abiding joy that really is our true nature as human beings, the humankind. And I'll leave you with that. I hope that's enough. It's enough for me. And certainly I think it is enough for today. May it be so. And we're going to sing. You can stand up or you can remain seating. It's your choice. It's number 323.
as we extinguish our chalice, and I invite you to say our extinguishing, uh, chalice extinguishing words as well as do the actions with me. We extinguish this chalice, but not the warmth of love, the light of truth, or the energy of action. We hold each other in our hearts until we meet again. I encourage you as we get ready to settle in for one final treat from our barbershop quartet. Thank you for bringing all of your brothers today. To offer you this from Hildegard de Binion, who wrote, good people, most royal greening verdancy, rooted in the sun, you shine with radiant light. In this circle of earthly existence, you shine so finely, it surpasses understanding. God hugs you. I love that line. God hugs you. You are encircled by the arms of the mystery of God. Go forth now and hug each other. Ask first, but hug each other. And may it be so. Please remain seated for the postlude. and these parapets of stone gazing at the people down below me and all my life I've watched them as I hide up here alone I'm hungry for the histories they show me and all my life I
can sing the bells of Notre Dame. What makes a monster and what makes a man? What makes a man? Sing the bells, 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 bells.